our next speaker, and I've stolen five minutes of her time, so I'll try and keep, is uh, Dr. Andrea Kidd-Taylor. Uh, she is a, a board member of Beyond Pesticides. Um, she's served on a, a number of prestigious panels, um, but the important thing is she's going to come and talk to her about a paper she wrote recently called Integrated Pest Management Policies in America's Schools, uh, Dr. Andrea Kidd-Taylor. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning everybody. I'm still trying to figure out why I'm here so early in the morning on a Saturday. <laughs> we got to talk about this day of getting up so early. Okay, this is a remote forward okay. reverse laser pointer. Great. Thank you. So, is there a need for integrated pest management policies on a federal level? That's what I'd like to talk about. But as already mentioned, we know that children are our most vulnerable. We know also that we have to leave our children some sort of future. Uh, we talk about the need for protection of children in the workplace, but I'm not workplace, I'm sorry, that's my past job. <laughs> but, um, and I, I wanted to mention just briefly before I started was that I came to the environment from the occupational health and safety movement. I worked for the United Auto Workers for 10 years in their health and safety department. And as a part of working there, we established policies for workers. And I realized that in an occupational health environment or in a workplace environment, you have a mo more focused environment. You know, the auto industry or the parts suppliers, the lead industry for batteries. But in the environment is such a larger perspective. And I met Jay after working at the Chemical Safety Board. I was uh, appointed by President Clinton on the Chemical Safety Board for five years uh, after working at the UAW. And now I'm at a university, Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland, which is an HBCU, historically black college and university. And what I like to do in my classes, actually because we're located in an urban environment, we try to link the health side with the management policies, with the management side, the scientific side, all together into what policies can be created. We're also concerned about the protection of our urban communities and what's happening there. And we have everything from obesity to HIV to exposure to pesticides, some of those things that we may not think about in an urban environment, but they're all there, cars, uh, fossil fuels, so in my talk today, I'm talking about integrated pest management and the need for health policy um, on a, a larger scale. So children are at a greater risk of developing asthma and other respiratory illnesses, as we know. And in a school environment, you have ants, cockroaches, termites, all those things that are mentioned there. Now, generally, schools have pest control from the traditional methods. How many, how many of you remember going into school on a Monday and smelling something that had been sprayed all around. Now, did they tell you ahead of time that there would be spraying going on? No. Outside on the lawns for lawn care, if you're playing football and you've got that beautiful green lawn, how is that treated with pesticides? So our children in all types of environments are exposed to pesticides and in many cases not even know it. And what we have to remember about urban communities, we already have a large um, risk of asthma from exposures to some of everything. So we know that there's sprayed, pesticides are sprayed indoors and outdoors, and we have additional risks that are created, um, including endocrine problems, neurological problems, and immune system problems. So, one of the things that I found in this small paper that I did for New Solutions is that there are a lot of different definitions for integrated pest management. In the textbook, I have one definition. Somewhere else, someone else has the definition. So as we implement IPM policies around the schools and in our local communities, we need to come up with one definition. 
And perhaps with the federal standard, we could do that. Now, integrated pest management di by definition is, this is the definition that Beyond Pesticides, the Maryland Pesticide Network, and several of the scientists have come up with. And it's the strategies that use safer methods, including sanitation. I'm not going to read through everything because I have 10 minutes and route is counting. And only after failure of these methods should the least toxic harmful pesticides be used. Now, when we say that, some folks say, well, what do we mean by least toxic? And who defines that? What's less harmful? But when we look at the definition, at least this is a start. Now, in talking about the problems with integrated pest management, as I've already mentioned, there are various definitions. Also, in many communities, adop adoption and implementation of IPM policies vary widely. You have one community that does this, another community that does that. Um, there are also too many inadequacies and inconsistencies in implementation. For example, in the state of Maryland, we currently have a rule that IPM must be implemented in the schools. There is no regulation, there is no monitoring, and it's just diverse all around. There are some schools that set up IPM, and there are many schools who don't, and there are some schools who don't even know that they're required to do anything about IPM. So school policies, again, vary widely. There are many state policies that are voluntary. And then some state IPM policies are housed in the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Environment, several different departments. So we have to talk about exactly what we mean when we talk about IPM and how do we want it to look from, I think, a broader scale if we're going to protect our children. There are at least right now 35 states that have some form of regulation or laws regarding the use of pesticides. There are also some state policies that address licensing and certification of state uh, pesticide applicators. So why is there a need for legislation? One is that we need better communication, better communication among the parents, among all of the stakeholders involved. So that includes the parents. That's the IPM um, pest management professionals, uh, the administrators, the maintenance staff, parents knowing what's going on. Right now, we have a lack of proper notification and monitoring. Uh, there's a lack of financing and administrative support and a lack of implementation and regulation with no penalties attached. There are also conflicts in IPM policy interpretation. And that, I think, goes back to the fact that we don't have a really clear definition that everyone can follow. Uh, there's a, the school IPM 2015. This is the strategic plan for IPM in schools. There was a group that met uh, stakeholders in Arizona, I believe, in 2009. And they came up with what they thought would be a plan for achieving full implementation of IPM by the year 2015. So it's 2012 now, so we've got three years, Jay, to try and get this implemented. Um, they identified four major categories, and these stakeholders included labor unions, uh, government agencies, uh, as well as uh, some I IPM um, contractors, and also I believe there were some industry people involved at this meeting. But they came up with four major categories for optimization of IPM, and that would include regulation, management, research, and education. So we do have, it's my understanding, SEPA for about the fourth or fifth time being introduced in Congress. It probably will not go anywhere because right now I don't believe they're co-sponsors. It was just introduced this week. However, I always say we can't ever say never. When we collectively work as environmentalists, we can also work for change and getting policies implemented. And that's where we need to push the envelope if we're really serious about protecting our children. Uh, this legislation, SEPA, the School Environment Protection Act, better defines um, IPM and the least toxic pesticides and actually what that means. 
It requires all schools to establish an IPM program and emphasizes the use of non-chemical strategies to manage pest problems. So in this legislation, there is uh, the least toxic pesticides is defined. Uh, it prohibits the use of synthetic fertilizers, allows use only in public health emergencies. There is notification of the IPM program, which means that parents, administrators, anyone in the neighborhood involved or nearby as a result of the application of pesticides or the least toxic pesticides if we're using IPM will have to be notified. And that there be an IPM coordinator who will keep track of all the material safety data sheets on the least toxic pesticides so that if parents have a question, that they can go to this coordinator on the local level and get information about the pesticides that are being used. That's very key, and I, I, I say that in my previous work in the workplace, it was really important that material safety data sheets be provided to workers. It's a requirement now, right? It's the community right to know. So we could have the same thing within the IPM standard. Uh, there would be a 12 panel national advisory board. And also, and I, I think that John mentioned preemption in his talk, in the case of the IPM legislation in SEPA, it says right up front that federal legislation does not preempt, preempt states or localities for having, from having a more robust IPM standard. So how do we move forward? One of the things that I say is any kind of action, any kind of work that involves getting a policy implement, implemented includes getting ourselves, getting you involved. It will not happen unless there's a grassroots effort to say that I want to see a change. I want to see an integrated pest management legislation in my community for my children. In the case of why I have a federal law, a federal law is best because it would ensure that all of our children in urban communities, rural communities, all around the country are protected by pesticide applications or from pesticide applications in school settings. Because we have to admit, our children spend most of their lives in school settings, indoor, outdoor. There have to be collaborative partnerships. Those are partnerships with the management, with the children, with the parents, with community groups and organizations in order to make it work. We also need to have financial and administrative support of such policies. And what we need when we say why federal policy, I know sometimes we say that we don't need federal legislation, but when you have federal legislation, it at least provides some sort of consistency, not only in the language of school IPM policies and the definition, and also in the implementation. So with that, I'd like to thank you. And there aren't time for questions and comments. I know we're moving and Ralph is standing to tell me that my time is up. <laughs> but hopefully, uh, in our next session, you'll get a chance to ask me questions. Thank you. Thank you.